Open a Bible to Genesis chapter 19, verse 28, and you'll find one of the most infamous moments in Christian storytelling. Abraham looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. The climax of the tale of Sodom and Gomorrah, it describes how the two cities looked the morning after God obliterated them in a rain of fire, killing all their sinful inhabitants. For most, it's a shocking moment, a brutal image that stays with you. But for those who were in the German city of Hamburg on the night of July the 27th to the 28th, 1943, Genesis chapter 19, verse 28 is more than a mere image. For the survivors, it's closer to a memory. That night, RAF Bomber Command unleashed Operation Gomorrah, the attempt to do to Nazi Germany what God did to the cities of the plain. For nearly an hour, incendiary bombs rained down onto Hamburg. What followed would be one of the worst firestorms in history. The Inferno more than lived up to its code name, devouring sinners and innocents alike. In a few short hours, up to 40,000 perished. Were they the victims of divine justice or a callous war crime? In today's video, we're investigating the Allied raids that forever changed how World War II's air war was fought. Every major war brings its own unique kind of suffering. The Boer War, for example, introduced the world to the horrors of civilian concentration camps. World War I to the mud and freezing misery of a conflict fought in trenches. In the case of World War II, it was the terror of death from above. The London Blitz, the bombing of Rotterdam, the fire bombings of Dresden and Tokyo. All through the conflict, the indiscriminate bombing of civilians became a gruesome hallmark. Yet, in the European theatre, all would pale into significance beside the deadliest raid of all, Hamburg. As aircraft technology improved over the interwar period, it had become clearer and clearer what devastation the future might hold. As early as 1932, former Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin had voiced concerns that the bomber will always get through, leading to a frantic race to kill as many civilians on each side as possible. Just five years later, Europe had gotten a sharp taste of this aerial destruction as German planes bombed the town of Guernica in the Spanish Civil War, killing hundreds. But it was with the outbreak of World War II that the Age of Annihilation from above really began. A single night in May 1941 would see 1,436 Londoners killed by air raids. A few months earlier, firebombs dropped onto Coventry not only killed 568, but nearly razed the city. Yet, even as the civilian toll grew, the Allies resisted revenge attacks. This is a military and not a civilian war, declared Winston Churchill. In other words, precision bombing German military targets was fine, but not carpet bombing towns. The only trouble was, the Allies absolutely sucked at precision bombing. In 1941, Britain's Bomber Command did the maths and discovered it was taking them five tons of bombs to kill a single German. Worse, only one in five of their bombs was dropping within five miles of the target. Rather than destroying the German war machine, their raids were mostly freaking out random farm animals. As Royal Air Force casualties mounted, it was decided a change in tactics was needed, a pivot away from Churchill's moral military war to something far less civilized. Luckily, Bomber Command was about to fall under the sway of a man for whom civilization was synonymous with target. Arthur Harris was a hard man for a hard time. An advocate of area bombing, Harris's solution to the RAF missing their targets was to simply make the targets bigger. Like, say, the size of a city. In 1942, the War Cabinet and Air Staff agreed to a plan that would have been unthinkable only a few months earlier. The aerial destruction of every German city with over 100,000 inhabitants. By now, Britain had lost some 40,000 civilians to the Blitz. On the continent, reports of Nazi atrocities were mounting. Everyone was tired of fighting a civilized war. Besides, there were reasons to think brutal tactics could help end the carnage. During the Blitz analysis, had shown that civilians who lost their homes often failed to report for work the next day. Destroy enough homes, and you could cripple German industry even if the factories remained standing. As Harris was fond of saying, if you can't hit the works, hit the workers. And this was just the beginning. Following massive investment in production in 1941, Harris now had under his command a staggering number of four-engine Avro Lancasters, each capable of carrying 8,000-pound payloads. Backed up with daylight precision attacks by U.S. Army Air Forces, Bomber Command could hit cities around the clock, destroying factories, homes, everything. 
and everything was exactly what Harris wanted destroyed. If the Allies could demonstrate their firepower on a grand scale, the shock might so damage morale that Germany would surrender. The plan was named Operation Gomorrah, after one of the cities God destroyed with fire from heaven. Only this time, it wouldn't be a vengeful deity killing the sinners, but the cold fury of Arthur Bomber Harris. Once the decision had been taken to wipe out a city, there was really only one obvious target. Hamburg was Germany's second largest metropolis, home to both 1.7 million industrious citizens and the vital industries they worked on. Its harbors produced U-boats and ships used in the war effort. Its port welcomed commerce from across occupied Europe. Vital components were built in its factories. In short, it was both a military target and the sort of place where a wave of biblical destruction would make a definitive statement, on par with wiping out modern day Chicago. It was also close. Perched near the northwest coast of Germany, Hamburg could be reached under the cover of darkness even during the shorter summer nights. And why attack at the height of summer? Because the Allies wanted Hamburg to burn. The build-up to Gomorrah was a flurry of testing to try and figure out the best way to engulf the city in a sea of flame. Luftwaffe incendiary attacks on London and Coventry had shown just how quickly fire could spread out of control, devouring all in its path. Now the Allies wanted to do that on a grand scale, creating a fire so big it would keep feeding itself long after the last bombs had fallen. That meant taking advantage of dry weather conditions and new American inventions like napalm. But it also meant researching the materials used for building Hamburg's homes, experimenting with different combinations of explosives to get the best results. In the end, a mix of heavy bombs and incendiaries was selected. The heavy bombs could blow out windows, damage roads, and destroy water mains, hindering the chance of anyone being able to fight the fires. Yet it wasn't just destruction that the researchers focused on. They also needed a way to escape Hamburg's defenses. Given it was the Reich's second biggest city, you might expect Hamburg to be protected. And you'd be absolutely right. The city bristled with flak cannons and searchlights, all deadly to air aircraft, all controlled by an advanced radar network. Fail to penetrate the ring of death, and it didn't matter how powerful your firebombs were. Fortunately, the Allies had the perfect window of opportunity. The invention of Welsh physicist Joan Curran, Operation Window is a top-secret weapon designed to render radar all but useless. Gigantic bundles of aluminium strips, window could be dropped from planes, and as the strips fell, they'd bounce signals back to the German radar stations, giving the impression of a sky filled with objects. With no way of telling what was an enemy aircraft, Hamburg's guns would simply blast away uselessly allowing the RAF to swoop in untouched. It was a tactic both extremely effective and extremely simple. In fact, it was so simple that the Germans had actually invented their own version sometime before, named Duppel. But because it worked so damn well, Hermann Goering freaked out that Allied spies would discover it and steal the idea, so he ordered all work halted and all research destroyed, including into possible countermeasures. Which is why, in July 1943, one of Germany's most important cities would be completely defenseless against radar chaff. Back in Britain, Arthur Harris finally confirmed Hamburg as the target on May 27, 1943. It was decided the RAF would hit the city's civilian center at night, while the Americans would target the factories south of the Ulster River by day. At last, on July 22, Harris took a meeting with meteorologists. They told him that the skies over Hamburg would clear in a couple of days. With that, the proud Hanseatic city's fate was sealed. Nothing now could save it from the wrath of God. Although it would be the night of the 27th to the 28th of July that went down in history, the operation began a few days earlier at exactly 9.45 p.m. on July the 24th. That evening, a short sterling bomber rumbled into life at an airfield outside Cambridge, taking off into a sky not yet fully dark. Over the next 75 minutes, more planes followed, mosquitoes, Halifaxes, Lancasters rising up into the gathering gloom and departing for the distant continent. All told, some 790 bombers were departing them that night, following the lights of blazing marker bombs dropped by pathfinders. At 20 past midnight, the first signs of the approaching force appeared on Nazi radar screens. Defensive aircraft were prepared, flat cannons trained. But then the city's defenses went haywire. Suddenly, radar screens were filled with confusing signals. Unable to get a lock on the approaching planes, gunners on the ground resorted to firing wildly into the air, hoping for the best. What they got instead was a lesson in divine retribution. Sometime just before 1 a.m. on July the 25th, the first bomb bay doors opened and Gomorrah's reign of destruction began. For 50 minutes, the RAF pounded the city, obliterating whole western districts. With radar useless, the Germans only managed to take out three of the attacking aircraft, three out of nearly 800. 
a pitiful amount. By contrast, the damage inflicted by the British was eye-watering. Heavy bombs took out the telephone exchange, exploded water pipes, destroyed air raid shelters. By early morning, some 54 miles of street front were on fire. Buildings collapsed with people still trapped in them. Others were killed by flaming debris. Overall, 1,500 people died in Hamburg that night. As the sun rose, it was on a smoking, smoldering city as brutalized as London had been during the worst nights of the Blitz. Had the raid stopped now, Arthur Harris could have still claimed victory. But rather than stopping, Gomorrah had only just begun. Across the North Sea, pilots in the US 8th Air Force were already preparing for the day ahead. 323 B-17 flying fortresses shuddering to life for a daylight raid on the wounded city. Around 4.30 p.m. on July the 25th, workers in the Blom and Voss U-boat yards looked up to see the latest wave of death approaching them. Over just 12 minutes, the Americans dropped their bombs onto the industrial area. While only 20 workers were killed, the follow-up raid still caused immense panic, terrifying the population and further tying up Hamburg's already stretched emergency services. It was psychological warfare from the air, an unrelenting wave of attacks designed to scare and intimidate. And Bomber Command had no intentions of letting up. With the smoke from the fires too thick for another major run, the city was buzzed that night by de Havilland mosquitoes. A minor assault, but one that kept residents sick with fear. Just hours later, 50 US bombers returned, this time aiming for as many industrial hubs as possible. In one minute attack, beginning at noon, Uncle Sam smashed up factories, destroyed docks, and took out a major power station, plunging nearly half the city into a blackout. In their wake, the Americans left another 150 dead and a city further paralyzed. By now, swathes of Hamburg were in flames. The city's infrastructure was close to collapse. Thousands upon thousands were homeless, wounded, or dead. Yet, when people later looked back on those grim days of the first raids, they would seem like a paradise compared to what came next. A mere trifle beside the planet-sized blamange of death that was still to come. Because the night of the 27th to the 28th of July was about to introduce a new hideous weapon into the arsenal of war, the Firestorm. As the west and south of Hamburg burned, survivors began to flood the city's east. There, the densely packed working-class districts of Borgfeld, Hammerbrook, and Hamm stood, their tall apartment blocks groaning under the weight of thousands of people. Watching the fires still engulfing the rest of the city, it's possible the workers felt relief that no bombs had dropped near them. After all, several hot days had left their district so parched and dry that any flame would be near impossible to put out. And that's exactly what the RAF were counting on. After a day of rest, the operation restarted on the evening of July the 27th. This time, over 720 bombers took off just after sunset, heading for Hamburg, not directly, but coming in over Lübeck in the east. It said that the guns around Lübeck didn't even try firing at the bombers as they passed through the night. The local commander too scared that they'd loop around and bomb his city instead. At last, just before 1am on July the 28th, the drone of heavy bombers could be heard over Hammerbrook, Borgfeld, and Hamm. For uncountable locals, it would be the last sound they ever heard. The destruction which befell East Hamburg that night was nothing short of biblical. Helped by the dry conditions, individual fires quickly linked up, joined together, expanded, and became a vast ocean of flame. As the inferno spread, temperature spiked, hitting a minimum of 800 degrees Celsius, enough to make stone glow, enough to make glass shatter, enough to make wood, fabric, and hair spontaneously burst into flames. In such heat, vehicles exploded, adding to the chaos. Apartment blocks turned into towers of flame, everyone inside burning up in a matter of moments. Clothing seared onto skin, flesh melted. In basements and air raid shelters, all the oxygen was sucked out, leaving thousands to suffocate. But even this had nothing on the winds. As heated air shot upwards, the fire sucked in oxygen from the surroundings until winds whipped through the streets at nearly 250 kilometers per hour, fast enough to literally drag people into the fire. As it did so, it gave an awful howling, the sound of air being channeled down narrow streets. To those present, though, it didn't sound like wind, it sounded like some invisible demon shrieking in triumph. It was a fitting image for such a hellish night. 19-year-old Kate Hoffmeister saw scores of people fallen on the road and melted asphalt stuck to their skin, holding them in place as they screamed for mercy. Henny Clank recalled watching as trees spontaneously burst into flame in the superheated air as escaped horses ran past in panic, their hair alight and their flesh already burning. Peering out from under a blanket soaked in water, Heinrich Johansson could only watch in horror as his neighbors turned into human torches consumed by the firestorm. 
amid this nightmare, survival was often down to just sheer dumb luck. Those close enough could leap into canals or run for open spaces and wastelands devoid of fuel for the fire. Those who happened to have sealed public shelters in their neighborhood were saved the loss of oxygen. Mostly, though, anyone caught in the heart of the inferno simply burned. At 1.47 a.m., the last Allied bomb fell onto Hamburg. By now, columns of smoke were rising 20,000 feet over the city. The glow of flames could be seen for miles around, casting evil shadows across the nearby countryside. As the planes turned back for England, a black rain began to fall, the result of hot smoke hitting cool air high up in the atmosphere. But for Hamburg citizens, the ordeal was far from over. The night of Gomorrah's peak, 2,326 tons of bombs fell on Hamburg, more than three times that dropped on London during the worst of the Blitz. Twelve miles of city were destroyed, and 16,000 apartments reduced to shells, leaving nearly half a million people homeless. As dawn finally broke, the fire still raged like some evil god gloating over its charred victims. Up in the air, the retreating Brits reported that they could smell burning flesh even from a distance. For some, the site was a cause for celebration. Brilliant, declared gunner Douglas Fry, better than earlier raids. But others were more pensive, more like Abraham looking down on the devastated cities of the plain. Hamburg raised for me for the first time the ethics of bombing, Flight Officer Trevor Timperlay later admitted, saying he couldn't stop thinking about the children killed. They were not involved, so you were left with a terrible feeling about them. And terrible is exactly how survivors in Hamburg felt. A 4 a.m. Nazi command made the decision to evacuate all non-essential civilians from the shattered city. What followed was a modern exodus. With all but three of the railways smashed, up to a million people fled Hamburg on foot. Refugees dispersing into the German countryside like smoke into the summer skies. All around them lay the charred bodies of the dead. 15-year-old Trout Cork remembered thinking at first that they were Taylor's dummies someone had left out in the street. There were just so many of them. No way that many people could have died in one night, could they? But if things were bad for the citizens of Hamburg, they were even worse for those the Nazis deemed subhuman. Faced with the scale of the destruction, orders were sent to Nunangama concentration camp to supply workers for the cleanup. At the time, Nunangama and its 85 subcamps mostly held Polish and Soviet POWs. Now, untold numbers of them were marched into the ruins of Hamburg and forced to recover the dead and bury them in mass graves. It was gruesome, miserable work. Aside from the sheer scale of destruction, there were the vermin that swarmed the ruins, black rats fat on barbecued scraps of human flesh. Worse still was what was in store for the common criminals that the Nazis dragooned into helping with the clearance. Organized into suicide squads, they were sent to try and manually defuse the bombs that failed to explode on impact. Not surprisingly, this only added to the attack's death toll. 450 miles away, though, in London, the feeling was very different. The RAF had lost just 21 planes in the raid, less than 3% of all of those sent out. Meanwhile, the utter annihilation of Hamburg had gripped the press. Newspapers declared Hamburg smashed and compared the attack to what the Nazis had done to Coventry. Even this early on, though, it was clear that Gomorrah was on a whole other scale. The most commonly cited death toll for this operation is between 35 to 40,000 people, the majority of whom died on the night of the 27th to the 28th of July. By way of comparison, the entire Blitz is thought to have killed 43,000 Britons over the course of eight months. There had simply never been an air raid on this scale before, nor was it yet over. 48 hours after he unleashed hell on the city, Harris sent another 770 bombers back to Hamburg. Although many had been evacuated, there still remained emergency services, necessary workers, and those too old or infirm to leave. That night, there was a second firestorm. While far fewer perished this time around, the number of dead was still anywhere between several hundred and a few thousand. The last raid came on August the 3rd. This time, an apocalyptic thunderstorm scattered the bombers and blinded the pilots. The bombs fell randomly, smashing the opera house, but failing to start another vast fire. And with that, Operation Gamora ended, at least in theory. Because, as we're about to see, its effects would last for years. Six years before Gomorrah, the bombing of Guernica had caused global outrage. Although as few as 250 are thought to have died, the images of widespread aerial destruction shook the world. Pablo Picasso even created a vast mural to commemorate it. Yet Gomorrah would make what happens at Guernica look like child's play. A few toys kicked over compared to 
Armageddon. Over eight nights, 9,000 tons of bombs had fallen on Hamburg. Half the city's homes were gone, along with 24 hospitals, 277 schools, and 580 industrial sites. The fires burned for weeks. The city remained paralyzed for months. For the survivors, the trauma would last a lifetime. But the effects were felt beyond just Hamburg. Across Germany, a cold fear began to grip those in other large cities. As rumors spread, so did the whispered question, are we next? For many, the answer would unfortunately be yes. Back in Britain, the success of Gomorrah had convinced Arthur Harris that large-scale area bombing was both possible and the ideal way to bring about the end of the war. Soon, the skies of Germany would become thick with Allied aircraft, beginning a pattern of destruction that would devastate around 130 cities. In some cases, the firestorm that engulfed Hamburg would be repeated. Kassel, Darmstadt, and infamously Dresden would all burn, their centers reduced to nothing but ash and memories. Nor would the tactic be confined to Europe. Once, over in the Pacific Theater, Harris's American equivalent, Curtis LeMay, would implement a series of devastating raids on Japanese cities modeled after Gomorrah. The worst would come on March 10, 1945, when firebombs were dropped on Tokyo. The destruction that night would be so great, the firestorm so grand, that even Hamburg's apocalypse would pale beside it. To this day, it remains the deadliest air attack ever carried out on a city. And yet, perhaps the saddest thing is that it was all unnecessary. Although Hamburg's raising left a huge psychological impact, terrifying even Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, the effect was less acute than the Allies had hoped. Harris had pictured one or two major attacks, forcing Germany to sue for peace. Instead, the Reich plowed on with its war of annihilation, refusing to surrender even as more cities went up in flames, fighting on to the bitter end, no matter how many bombs the RAF dropped. Many had even argued that Harris's tactics became counterproductive, that hurling everything at military targets could have ended the war sooner than terrorizing Germany citizens. Yet, flush with the success of Gomera, Harris refused to change tack. Because of this, countless civilians would die. Today, the firebombing of Hamburg occupies a strange place in the collective memory, both in Germany and abroad. While the 1945 destruction of Dresden has become a stand-in for the horrors of the air war, the far deadlier raid on Hamburg remains little known, rarely commemorated. Partly that may be because, unlike Dresden, Hamburg was a well-defended military target, a place that, icky as it is to admit, made perfect sense for the Allies to attack. And then there's the way Germany itself remembers the war in a nation deeply aware of the scale of Nazi atrocities. Commemorating Gomorrah is difficult. While a museum exists in Hamburg, the exhibition takes care to contrast the city's suffering with that of Coventry and London in the Blitz, or the suffering of those in the nearby Nunangama camp. Perhaps it is telling that during one commemorative event held several years back, a group of German protesters held up a banner declaring Operation Gomorrah. There is nothing to mourn. Yes, it would be foolish if we simply allowed the bombing of Hamburg to slip into the shadows. Here, for perhaps the first time, the sheer destructive power of aerial bombing was demonstrated in full. A power that would shape civilian experiences for the rest of the war, both in Germany and in Japan. We may still debate whether Gomorra was a legitimate tactic or a war crime, but that shouldn't stop us from remembering the night of the 27th to the 28th of July 1943, the night when a once great city was destroyed by fire from heaven.